So good afternoon. Hopefully all of you are excited as I am to hear from Blessing as well as our panelists afterwards. Um, so Blessing, we have a little bit of time for you to tell us first off, what have you been doing since you left us and left this campus? First of all, I would like to say thank you to everyone for being here, supporting me and yeah, just being interested in learning more about my journey and the Boundless journey as well. So I graduated Drexel in 2021 and I started working at Microsoft as a user experience product manager. And I remember when I was in um, sophomore year, pre-junior year, I was very adamant about working at Microsoft. It was my dream company. And so I was privileged enough to start working there. Um, it was a great experience, you know, working at a big tech company um, as a product manager. I learned a lot and Drexel definitely helped me to learn a lot about it as well. Um, but then unfortunately last year I was laid off and that hit me hard because I was like, I don't know, like no one taught me anything. I, I don't know what to do. Right. Um, but it gave me the opportunity to learn or to think about what I wanted to do next. Um, and so I started to think about graduate school, which is something that I didn't think I would be doing now. Um, but again, being laid off, I was like, okay, the world is my oyster, as they say. So what do I want to do? Um, as you'll read in my book, hopefully, um, and as the Dean mentioned, I did grow up in the UK and I always wanted to go back to the UK. So I found the opportunity to go back to the UK and to study um, for my master's program. So I'm currently at the University College London studying education and technology. Um, and alongside that, I am working at Rewriting the Code, which is a global community for women in tech, both students and um, early career professionals. So I work there as a community development manager. And it's just, it's great to give back because Rewriting the Code is actually a fellowship that I was part of when I was in my sophomore year. So it came like a full circle moment. Um, well, yeah, that's a little bit about what I've been up to. Okay. Well, we're excited to hear about it. And all of you, we also want to stress, not <laughs> only <laughs> has she done all these wondrous things, but she's been able to document them for you to share in her journey. And so um, Blessing has a book called Black Bound to be Boundless. And we have a raffle. So hopefully you keep track of your raffle tickets because we're giving away some of the books, but you can purchase them to support her. So we also encourage you, if you get it, also buy one for a friend. But um, tell us a little bit about, okay, you haven't been on the planet that long. <laughs> what made you write this book and tell the world about your journey as a third culture kid? Yeah. So I was born in Nigeria. And before the age of two, my family and I moved to Germany. And after around six years, we moved to Scotland. After around 10 years, we moved to the United States. And after eight years of living here, I moved back to the UK, specifically in England, though. Um, and growing up, I just, I went through a lot, both identity, just friendships relationships all of that stuff I didn't know who I was because you see me as a physically a black person but in a predominantly white country in Germany and I grew up speaking German German was actually my first language so just general generally there was a lot of things that I didn't understand at such a young age and as I grew up and I started to make friends and learn more about other people I learned that okay there are other people that are also in my shoes that have lived in different countries or they were born in one country and grew up in another. And so that's where this idea of a third culture kid comes from. Um, and you, I think you see it a lot more now where perhaps, especially in the African continent, mm -hmm. you're born there, but then maybe your parents want a better life for you. And so you live in the Western world. And I just wanted to be able to document my journey in a way that it will help and inspire other people because I think I didn't realize how much I would go through and I didn't realize the hardship I would also face until early on. Um, and so, yeah, I think the book came about when I had surgery um, just before my senior year of at Drexel. 
um, at the beginning of 2020, I was diagnosed with a tumor and it was a lot on me physically, mentally, everything. And I remember I had the long awaited surgery, which you can read about in the book. <laughs> and while I was resting, I realized, OK, this is a great time for me to write about this journey. Um, and so I did. And three years later, the book is <laughs> the book is in my hands, but it wasn't easy. Um, you know, there's the statistics that a lot of people that start writing a book don't actually finish it. And so it took a lot for me, it took a support system. It took me stopping and starting and stopping and starting and stopping and starting um, to really get this out there. But I'm proud that I have. And I hope that is really encouraging both to third culture kids, but also people who perhaps have just lived in one place their entire life. I think there's something that everyone can learn from it. Okay. So talk a little bit more about the being a third culture kid and how that impacted your career. Mm. So I think the best example I can give was when I started working at Microsoft and I had my interview. Um, and during the interview, I talked about how, you know, I was, I was learning to advocate for myself. Um, and I talked about how ideally, if they were to hire me, they're going to hire someone with experience in Nigeria and Germany and Scotland and the United States. So you don't have to, or they didn't have to, um, they didn't have to hire four different people. They get four different perspectives with one person. Mm -hmm. And so that helped, or that was kind of like a twist where I started to realize that, oh, okay, my experiences actually, I can bring them forth in my career as well. Mm -hmm. And I remember as well, I worked at Bing, um, the search engine, and for the Nigerians or the West Africans in the room, there was a case where um, I'm working on the image search team. And the thing about... <laughs> The thing about Bing and search engines is that if you were to type in something like soup, mm -hmm. um, in my culture, we have something called, let's say like okra soup, mm -hmm. um, which is not the tomato soup that you get in right. the Western right. world. Um, but I was able to come to my team and say, hey, you know, respectfully, mm -hmm. when I'm typing okra soup into Bing search, I'm not trying to see cans of tomato soup. Right. You know, it's not the same thing. And so that's where I realized that, okay, you know, not everyone can say that because they don't have the knowledge and they don't have the background. But I've been able to find just different ways that I can use my background, whether it's my knowledge of speaking German or being able to relate to West Africans or, I don't know, being able to understand and dissect the British accent. Right. Um, I've been able to find that there are different things that I can actually bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I also want to let people know that, yeah, okay, you might be from Texas or um, Saudi Arabia or Nigeria, but there are things that you, your background, it might not be in your job description, but there are things that you can bring forth on the table, so. So in your chapter, drawing everybody back to the book, <laughs> which you can win in the raffle, or you can buy one on Amazon for a friend. So talk, you talked about your experiences at Drexel. So talk about your experiences at Drexel. You talked about advocating for yourself. Talk about how those experiences played out at Drexel. Yeah. So I came to the United States in my senior year of high school and it was an abrupt change. I didn't want to come to the United States, but because of my dad's job, my whole family had to move. And so I was now in a place where I had to start afresh in my senior year of high school. Um, I had to make new friends, I had to learn a new education system, I had to think about the next part of my journey, which was undergrad. And at that moment in time, I wanted to actually go back to the UK, but I realized, you know, all of my family's here, I might as well stay. But because of my moving and everything, I became a very quiet person. In high school in America, I was very quiet, timid, I didn't want to talk to anyone, I just wanted to go to class and then go back home and that was it. But I realized that as I'm staying in the United States and I'm, my parents are paying a lot of money, I needed to make the most of that money. And so coming to Drexel, I was like, okay, I need to, I need to put myself out there. And I think that's what the Dean talked about, about me making myself visible, because I realized at that point I was an international student and I realized that I needed to do what other people aren't necessarily doing. And so I pushed myself and I tried to do things. I tried to start 
um, things I tried to put my hands up in class and just be known because I knew that that's how I can get opportunities drawn to me. No one's going to know if you don't speak up and no one's going to give if you don't ask as well. Um, and so in the book, I talk about my journey as a computer science major and how in my classes, I didn't see anyone that looked like me. And so myself and my two friends, Sanubar and Saba, we created a an organization or a um, student organization called the Freshman Cohort Program, which brought together 40 women. Um, and the purpose was not just to recruit more women in tech, but to retain them as well, because like myself, we realized that computer science isn't necessarily, or it doesn't look like it's for us, but I wanted it to be. And so, yeah, I started to just pursue more things. And um, through that is actually also where I met my mentor, Angela, and seeing someone like her really just pushed me to be more than I thought I could be. And so I think it also goes back to Drexel as an institution because I can be this person that wants to do things and, and achieve great things. But if the institution itself doesn't support you, then there's only so much that you can do. And so, yeah, I'm grateful. I mean, you were my, <laughs> you were my professor for one of my classes. So I'm just grateful for um, the opportunity to come back here. I'm grateful for the person that Drexel created me to be because five years here, um, it's a lot of time to spend. <laughs> um, so it was definitely the breeding ground for the person that I look at myself now. So what would you tell an 18 year old coming to Drexel in their second quarter about midterm, about how to stay resilient and speaking up for yourself, whether they be international or new to Philadelphia, what would you say to encourage them? So I remember during the time that I was working for this um, student organization and trying to get out there, um, as much as it was a great thing and as much as, as we were advocating for women in technology, we did see some backlash. And especially, you know, with the work that I was doing on LinkedIn, I saw that people were uncomfortable with it. And I started to question myself that, oh, maybe I should shrink back because people, people don't like this new me. And for me, it was already a bit foreign because I was that shy girl. Um, but I don't know. I think if anything, it was just a support system. I know we came to you about oh, this is what was happening, you know, Angela as well. And the support helped to keep me going. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that I would say as well, that it's not easy. I know that being an international student, being a student in general, it's not easy. Where, where, Whether you are in your first year or your final year, it's not easy. But I think if there's anything that you can get from my experience and from the experience of the panelists that will come up in a bit is that it's possible, like, I know it's difficult, but you can do it. And there's the importance of, yes, surrounding yourself with people that can support you and champion you, but, and champion you, but you yourself also need to talk to yourself and you need to have a healthy relationship with yourself because, yeah, when you don't have the community, you have to rely on yourself. And I think that's something that being at Drexel also taught me to do because Drexel was the first time that I lived away from home. By home, I meant, you know, with my family. Um, and so it taught me to be independent, but it also taught me to be strong. And especially being at Drexel, I know right. it's not <laughs> it's not easy with the quarter system and co-op. And I think it's also something that um, helped me to be resilient going into the workforce. Um, it taught me about time management. It taught me about um, being resilient and just different things, dealing with change. Um, so yeah, that that's a little bit of what I would say about that. Okay. And so now you're on this new path in graduate school. What made you choose that? And then what do you think it will bring for you? What do you think are the, are the benefits of getting a graduate mm -hmm. education? So as I mentioned before, I decided to go to graduate school because, I mean, I got laid off. So I was thinking of what my options were. And um, I thought that, okay, as I'm waiting, the tech industry is also not great right now. And so I decided that as I'm waiting, let me let me upskill and let me um, educate myself a bit more. So I thought, hey, graduate school was a great way to do that. Um, and I'm doing my course of study is called education and technology. So it mixes my background in tech with my pursuit 
or my passion for education. Mm -hmm. um, and so far, I mean, this is my second term that I'm in right now. And so far, I've really enjoyed what I'm learning. I think it's, it's definitely a step up from undergrad and I've had to learn that the hard way. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoy it. I like the practical side of it. I think something that scared me about graduate school at first was that I didn't know what I wanted to go deeper into. And that's why I didn't want to do graduate school in the very beginning, because I didn't know if I had to choose a technical major, what I would do. Um, but I think, I think it was good for me to go into the workforce and to get experience and then decide, okay, I can now go back and I can feed into the curiosity that I have with education and technology. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a good experience so far. And okay. um, there's a lot of great resources at the school that I'm at. And um, yeah, I think leaving graduate school, it will help me, it will help to position me better when I'm going back into the workforce, what, whatever it is that I choose to do next. Okay. And what is that you <laughs> think you're going to do next? What's next for Blessing? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I've always been a person that, like, if you know me, my calendar is always filled, like, three months in advance. I'm always, I know what I want to do. Um, but over the years, as things have happened, I've just realized that I can't really, you know, I can have plans and I can have visions, but at the end of the day, life happens. I didn't know that I was going to get a tumor mm -hmm. a few years ago. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I was going to get laid off from Microsoft last mm -hmm. year. So it's just about learning how to pivot mm -hmm. and I guess like bloom where you're planted. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, big dreams. Okay. Hopefully I can build a school one day. That would be really cool um, right. to bring my my educational experiences together. Um, but right now, I think I'm just trying to live in the moment. If you okay. know me, I'm always busy, but I think I need to rest. Okay. So, yeah, I'm going to try and do that. Okay. Well, congratulations <laughs> for that. So we um, really want to thank you for coming. We give her. <laughs> we thank you for sharing with um, the students that are here. And we hope you all have lots of questions. But next, we're going to bring up a panel um, to talk about their experiences and how they have found success at a place like Drexel. So you can introduce them. Yeah. Okay. So um, we're moving on to the next portion of the session. Um, and I would like to invite some of my friends um, to the stage. Noma, David, and Usma. If you give them a round of applause, please. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well. As part of this event, I wanted to bring together other voices. And if there's something that you know about me is that I don't like to do things alone. I love community. I love people. And so I wanted to bring together this amazing um, group of people, people that I've been inspired by, people that I've watched and learned a lot from. Um, and yeah, we'll go through some questions and I hope that you'll be able to learn a bit more about their journey um, and hopefully inspires you too. So we'll start with um, Usman, if you could just introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Usman Juf. I'm class of 2019. I currently work at Comcast Business um, on their financial planning analysis team. So a little bit about me. Um, on a, Outside of like business world, I cook a podcast on music, speaking with up and coming artists in Philadelphia. Um, I'm big into the tech scene as well. So just learning everything about tech, communicating, having conversations with people about new technologies is happening in the workspace. Um, but that's all about me. Hi, everyone. My name is Naman Zaduru. Um, really quick, fun fact, Busting was my first friend at Drexel. Like the first friend I ever made. So that's this is really, really cool. Um, I 
would describe myself as a multi-hyphenate. Uh, I'm class of 2020, uh, so I was only here for four years. Wesson was here for five. Um, Career-wise, my nine to five, I work in biotech. I studied biomedical engineering when I was at Drexel, um, specialized in biomaterials and tissue engineering. So I work full-time in biotech right now. And then I'm also a model as well. I've worked with Ulta. If you go to any store in Ulta as of last year, you will see me in it, Reba, Mac, a lot of stories. Um, I'm very interested in modeling and passionate about that as well. I love to travel. Um, I also have a podcast called The Med to Be for Black Health Professionals. People about their experiences and personal and living as a Black health professional in America and other countries as well. Um, I think that's all about me. Hello, hello. Uh, my name is David. I was born in London, raised in Ghana, and uh, currently I'm studying information systems, uh, a master's in information systems at Drexel University. I did my undergrad in, I started with software engineering, and then I switched to information systems, and uh, thank you, Drexel, for facilit facilitating that change. Um, I did three co-ops, um, all great experiences. The first one happened uh, during the pandemic, so unfortunately all three of them were not in person, but I was glad to be able to have those experiences. Um, on the side, I create content on Instagram and YouTube. Um, I have, I guess, a burden on my heart and um, in my, on my mind to help people in any way I can. So, um, yeah, that's what I focus on doing in any way I can and while studying uh, information systems in Drexel University. Um, and the accent changes sometimes when I'm talking. Sometimes I sound very Ghanaian and uh, other days I sound very uh, English. So, <laughs> yes. Oh, well, thank you. Um... Yeah, very excited to start this conversation. Um, I'm going to throw you guys into the deep end a little bit. <laughs> um, so in my book, it's called Bound to be Boundless, and it was strategically so because I didn't want it to just be called Boundless. Um, boundless makes it seem like, I don't know, everything is fine, everything is limitless, but I know that there are cases in life where you do feel limited and you are limited. Um, and so I wanted to ask all of you, about the most difficult time that you experienced in university um, and how did you get through it? We can start with Iswan. So I transferred to Drexel. Um, I came in as a pre-junior um, in health science. And in my first quarter here, I would say is when I transitioned from it being like my most difficult time at Drexel, going from a semester system to a quarter system and realizing that midterms start week three and not week seven. So the first week of class is week one and you have to be on top of your material. So I came in a little bit too relaxed and didn't have enough time to like catch up within the 10 weeks I have to study all the material. So my first quarter here, I almost failed like almost all my classes. Uh, as a health science major, you may know that like if you want to go to medical school, like that's not the best thing. So I had to really pivot to learn and understand if this is something I'm willing to really pursue. Um, and I took my second quarter here, still taking health science classes, but then having conversations with my counselor about other options and really fell in love with the business side, especially entrepreneurship. And knowing something that I have a passion for understanding the entire business of a company, whether that's marketing, operations, and administration, and fell in love with entrepreneurship as a whole. So I completely pivoted um, after having conversations with peers of mine, teachers, professors about what I want to do after college and made that decision to move, change my degree from health science to um, something that's entrepreneurial and still have the background of health science and know that I took chemistry, um, biology as well. I still have that knowledge. So anytime I have questions or conversations with people, um, it's still helpful to know that information, um, especially when if I went to pursue a build a business in that particular environment. Thank you. Yeah. No more. So I was thinking about, and I have, one is a little like 
share this one, but the second one is a much deeper answer, but I can give both of you the quick. They're kind of too. So the first one was, I think, in my second or third year. I was going through heartbreak. Yes, it happens. And, um, <laughs> and you know, people usually cut their hair, get a tattoo, get a piercing. I decided to study abroad. I went to Hong Kong. I got a scholarship from the Benjamin A. Gilman Fund. And I also got some scholarship from the Drexel Study Abroad Program. And I went to Hong Kong and I studied there for a semester, which is one of the most which is one of the best things I did for myself, that aside, but because I became boundless in adapting, I've never been in a place where I am one of one, skin tone wise, accent wise, hair wise. Um, I studied at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. I traveled to Bali on my own, solo travel for the first time at the age of like 19. Um, it was a wonderful experience. I think I also went to Korea. There was a lot of places I went to at the time. Um, it was a great experience because I learned how boundless I could be in adapting to an environment, also adapting growing wise. Um, the reason I would say that it's connected to the second one is there's someone that I met there, a friend that I came very close to. She actually passed, I think, um, in 2020. And this is the second moment that was also very life changing. She passed and it was also in the height of the pandemic as well. And I was also graduating around that time. So it was a lot of change at one time, change of place. I think I moved home because there was no, there was no class in person. So it was just a lot of change. Also trying to plan what was going to happen after graduation. Um, I planned to go to med school straight after meds, after. Um, undergrad, I didn't get into med school. So it was a lot of change at one time. Um, and I think what helped was really one, just feeling through the change. Um, I don't like to let feelings linger. So I felt through the change. Um, I talked to my friends and family and I also gave myself time. Because I think when you're in college, you're used to waking up and going to class. We used to waking up and going from A to B. But when you transition outside, there's so much change. You just need to give yourself time to change. So that was that was my. Hello. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to do something interesting. I tend to ramble a lot. So I'm going to set a little timer to make sure that I stay within the bounds of what I want to say. Um, I, I literally have a timer. All right. Oh, one hour. Slow down. <laughs> All right. Uh, so with me, um, Coincidentally, I also had my heart broken, but not from like a romantic aspect, more like platonically, I realized um, like I kind of cut my friends off and I didn't realize I was emotionally volatile when I came to uni. Um, Cause coming from Ghana, like I was very sheltered. Like I didn't go anywhere. Even going to my best friend's house across the street required like a whole stipulation, a contract. It's like, hey, you need to make sure you're here. I know who's, I was like, you work with his father. You know who he is. It's like, no, 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 I have to. So um, all these like, Coming from that to absolute freedom or more, way more freedom than I was used to, um, I didn't actually know who I was until certain things started to happen. And I realized, oh, OK, I don't have I'm not in control of my emotions as much as I think I am. So I just cut all my friends off, even my roommates. And that kind of showed me that, oh, I'm not this kind, humble person that I really thought I was. And that sort of changed. Um, it, it broke my heart just with my like my relationship with myself. And coincidentally, Blessing uh, was actually like the person I met who kind of talked to me, like talked to me and really kind of steered me on the right path. And this was all happening while I had my first, like before I had my first co-op, um, when I had moved, we had moved into a new apartment, just um, a lot of things happening at once. And when all those things are happening at once, it's sort of hard to see through like everything when you're just like, I'm in it. So you need someone who has like an objective outside view. It's like, okay, how about this? How about this? How about that? But you also have to take the steps to actually do that. Like she would be on a Zoom call with me at like 7 a.m. I don't wake up at 7 a.m. And just to actually get me on track. And so I really, really appreciate that. And so how I got through the challenge was with people. Like, ironically, I was running from people. But the thing that solved that problem was more people coming to help me. So um, that that wouldn't have happened unless I was in that environment. And um, community was a really, really, really helpful thing. And uh, there's a campus in ministry called ENC. And that's actually where I saw her the first time. I didn't even know I was going to be friends with her like just randomly so it's sort of like all these things happen but you have to be um available for it to actually you, you to take advantage of it because help can come you can watch a lot of podcasts and youtube videos all you want but if you don't actually put into practice or put yourself in a place where you can practice these things you will never actually amount to not not you but the <laughs> the effort you're making won't actually work so yeah one minute 10, ten seconds <laughs> oh, thank you i appreciate um your insights about that and I think as we talk about difficult seasons and difficult times, um, 
we also talk about mental health. And in my book, I talked about how the physical challenge of having a tumor affected me probably more emotionally and mentally than physically. Um, it was also during the pandemic. And so if you know anything about the pandemic and doctors, it was just, it was difficult to get an appointment. I, w I just felt so alone. I had my surgery by myself. Like it was just a lot mentally. Um, and so Usman, I wanted to ask you like how, how have you, I guess, dealt with your mental health especially now working at comcast and this whole adulting journey and you mentioned um uh going from one school to drexel and there was just a lot but just in adulting in general i know there's no blueprint for it so how have you dealt with that yeah that's a good question so i would say for me it was having like great people around me um that i could go to and lean on and ask for advice where that's even a pair or uh, someone that I look up to and admire. I think for me, my when it comes to like mental health, when I, when I'm having a bad day or even a great day, being able to have a conversation with a pair, um, like my best friend, he's here today, um, watching me speak, um, and I can lean on him when I have a down day and have a conversation with him for advice or even some guidance, knowing that it may be something he's going through as well. And he could share his perspective and his story with me too. And I know that for myself that I'm not alone in whatever struggles I'm going through. And for that information, it helps me like ease my mind, knowing that I'm not the only one dealing with a terrible situation. Maybe it's at work or within class or with like another friend of mine. I could have an open conversation and my friends could have an open conversation with me about the issues that they're going through as well, and I could be respective and reflect my own experiences with them. So I think just involving yourself with people that you know that you care about, they care about you and having an open conversation with them goes a long way in terms of like with your mental health and just avoiding people that just, you know, that gives off negative energy every time you have a conversation with them. I think that's helped me go on my a thought journey so far. Good. Um, I think it goes back to your identity as well and knowing who you are and for me I struggled with that a lot because I always felt like I wasn't Nigerian enough even though I am black even though my name is Blessing which most <laughs> Nigerians have um, <laughs> but then I also didn't feel German enough even though I lived I grew up there I my first language was German but it's like I wasn't seen as German then I also wasn't Scottish enough because I don't know, I mean, I have the accent, but I don't look Scottish, but all of my life, that's all I've known. And then I'm also not American enough because I'm not a citizen or I don't have the accent. And so all my life, I, I was just between everything. Um, but I personally, I'm a Christian and I had to learn that my identity comes from God and that helped me a lot. So I wanted to ask you, David, how has your personal identity um helps you go through challenges specifically. I feel like someone wrote our script similar because <laughs> I, I was literally about to say the same thing. Like you, I sound like this, but I tell you I'm from Ghana. I'm like, but the accent. I'm like, <laughs> then I have to explain the whole thing. And um, I think when when it's like that, when you are part of different groups and the groups have known characteristics, when you don't fall into those characteristics, it's like, okay, you're like outside of it. But you do belong to both. But it's like, okay, you have to pick one. It's like, I, I can't pick one. Because if I pick one, they'll think I'm betraying the other. If I sound like this, they think, oh, he must be too posh for like to be gone in. I'm like, no, I love Ghana. Like, <laughs> uh, so having that sort of internal battle um, was very tough. But like you said, um, I'm also a Christian and putting my identity in something that is eternal beyond me. It's not just, oh, temporary, like right now in, in this, like in this realm, it's more like outside of me, eternal. So it doesn't, even if I mess up, even if I do something that is out of my character, I'm like, okay, no, there's still hope. There's still, um, uh, a possibility for redemption just so that I don't completely give up on myself. So basing my identity in something, and it's something that everyone can actually look into themselves for. If it's like, you have to consider the criteria for whatever you're putting your identity on. Is it like long lasting? Is it eternal? Is it beyond yourself? Or is it just like something, if it's in money, when you run out of, when you run out of money, who are you? Like if it's in your nationality, 
when people who are from the same place you're from don't accept you, who are you? So sort of like asking your, yourself these questions can help you, I guess, dig deeper and figure out exactly what your identity is based on. So based on the um, foundation that you base your life on, which mine is, is Christ, um, but also everything else is included. Like, don't get me wrong, but the main foundation, like what's the, the, the root of your foundation or what's the root of your identity? So with me, same thing. Um, I just have that community. And I think when you're here, you need two things, responsibility and a support system, right? It's like when you have those two things, it 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 doesn't become your identity, but it helps you channel it in a in a good way. So yeah, just Jesus, support system, and responsibility. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's good. And we go back to identity again. Um, and I wanted to talk a bit about mindset shifts. Um, because as I mentioned, when I came to the United States, I came as a very timid and shy person but I knew that I needed to change something in my mind for me to get what I needed whether it's friends or scholarships or job opportunities and I mean Norma mentioned how we met um, and I remember when the summer before getting to Drexel I joined the Facebook accepted group for like Drexel students and I went down the entire member list and looked for I guess African names or I looked for black people so that I could message them on Facebook and basically befriend them before coming to campus. And I did that strategically so that I know me and I know that I can't really do in person. Hey, how are you? How's your day? I can't do that stuff. So. Um, but I knew that virtually, digitally, I can, I can do that. And so I decided that, okay, let me make friends before I come to campus so that by the time I'm on campus, I already have people. It's not as awkward for me and that's how I met Norma. We lived in the same um, hostel, I guess. Yeah, Towers. Um, and I messaged her, I think, on Group Me. And um, yeah, but I say that all to say that it took a mindset shift. It wasn't something that I was, I'm not a talkative person. I'm not an extrovert, but I realized that I, need to, I needed to push myself. And so Norma, I wanted to ask you, like, what mindset shifts have you had to make to be where you are now? I think it's becoming um it's actually becoming bound to boundless. No, not to no, literally. Um, so the example that came to mind was with med school. So I still plan on going to med school. That's something that's always been on my mind. Um, I plan to go to med school as soon as I graduated from Drexel. And I was on the phone with someone my dad connected with me with. She's a a professor in a position at a university in New York and I was telling her about like I think I was like 17 or 18 I'm going to go to med school as soon as I finish I'm going to be graduate in this so many years and she was like mama you know people actually take two to three years off before they go to med school and I was like what does that have to do with me that has nothing what does that have to do with me please and so uh and take note you can't like you can't go to med school everything is a I don't know if people are familiar but it's a one year off thing so if I'm working now it's to go to med school next year I'm talking now to this person and I haven't even taken the MCAT and I'm supposed to go to med school as soon as I graduate that was not going to happen but I was operating on my own timeline and this is the pandemic as well so it's okay let me just take the MCAT let me just take it. People usually study for three to six months, but I'm different. I can study in X amount of time and I can get the score that I want. I took the exam. I did not get the score that I want. I was like, okay, you know, it's okay. You know, once is fine. Um, I got into Johns Hopkins for my master's program. So I got a, I was in master's at the same time. I think I also start date a little bit so that I could take the MCAT. Um, I started the program and I was like, okay, I'm in, I'm in grad school. John Hopkins is a great school. Let me use the opportunity to network and connect and I'll take the MCAT again. Again, I studied it, took it, and I didn't do well. And I'm like, okay, that's a little, that's a bit much, you know, let me, let me, let me, chill. let me see what's going on. And so um, in the course of me, like reflecting on me taking it the second time, um, I also have a mentor who has a similar story to me, but um, I connected with her and she's like, no, I just like take a moment to just think if this is something you really want. And I the thing this I took the exam in September, the second time, anyone, let's say. And for the next, I think, three months, I was in a state of like, oh, my God, like, what if I actually cannot get into med school? What if I'm not as smart as I thought I was? What hap What becomes of me if I don't go to med school? I've told so many people I want to go to med school. What happens now? And I just started having a lot of anxiety. 
and panic. And I don't get panic attacks. Just started feeling so like, oh my God, like what is going to happen now? Why did I go to Drexel and get a master's? Why did I get a biomedical engineering degree in this? Like it's just a lot of tunneling and overthinking. And there was one day where I kind of just like literally hit the bottom. And I call one of my friends and I'm like crying to her. And I'm saying that I literally feel like I have nowhere. Like I'm at the bottom of where I never thought I would be here. I never thought I would be here two years outside of college, not in med school, still at home, like just like not where I thought I would be. And she's like, no, well, relax. She's like, when you're at the bottom, she said when you're at the bottom is when you, she said when you're at the bottom, you can literally only go up from there essentially, right? And I think for me, that moment was my boundless moment because I realized when I had been bound to what it looks like to be someone who is in med school, what it looks like to be smart. I feel like a lot of times I'm always trying to, I was always trying to prove to people that like, I guess I'm as smart as I was, you know, I'm a biomedical engineer. I went to, I go to Hopkins, you know, all of this, is, they're just things, you know, they're just things. And I was bound to the plan that was set before me, not just by me, but by expectations of like growing up in an African home and being, you know, a doctor, lawyer, engineer, just expectations of the system, expectations of I put on myself, timelines as well of wanting to be a doctor by X years old and everything. And I think when I had finally broken from all those chains of those expectations is when I became boundless. And I realized there are so many fruitful things and beautiful things in this time of my life that I would never have taken advantage of if I was in school. Um, so like me getting my master's from Hopkins, I think that's something that's been super helpful to me to... Um, I went to boarding school for high school. And so I actually didn't live with my family. So me now post-college is the first time I lived with my family in years. When I was in high school and college, my sister used to send me emails and I used to be like, oh, do you remember me? Do you like know who I am? These are my sisters, guys. And I've never like spent time with them like I have now. I've gotten the opportunity to model, which has been really, really fun and build content and travel the world, which is something I would have never done if I was still in med school. And not to say that, at the right, I know that at the right time it will happen, but I'm boundless and my mind has changed to realize that I am more than just med school. When I do everything that has that will get me there is an addition to, to my story. So yeah, yeah. that was my question. Oh, that's good. Uh, <laughs> Sorry you. for the long. <laughs> no, you're good. Thank you, Nova. Um, and so Isman, you talked a bit about how the role that networking has played um or not necessarily networking but just having a support system having a community and i know that there are a few people in this room who are either early on in their career or they're about to graduate and enter the working world so outside of i guess networking or if you wanted to add something more onto that um what advice would you have for someone that is early on in their professional career yeah so i think what has been helpful for me is that I'm like very, very social. So I tend to like try new things, whether that's joining like different clubs, um, new activities, just to meet and connect with people and have conversations outside of things that I'm comfortable. So I think really try to put yourself out there in uncomfortable situations and try to meet new people and have conversations and get different perspectives about where those people are coming from and have conversations about like what you aspire to do, what you're interested in, understand what they're interested in as well. And you'll start to see that once you do that more and more, it starts to count compound over time where you start to meet people in places where you actually want to go. So for me, it led me to my mentor who I met this past year by from a friend of a friend that I met at Drexel, where this individual, his father happened to be running for mayor at the time. And he introduced me because I worked at Comcast. Um, and the mentor eventually put me in a position with senior leadership at Comcast to have a leg up about what I'm interested in, what I want to do in my career. So I would never have gotten that opportunity if I wasn't willing to just go out there and be willing to mingle and meet and network with people who are essentially running the city. 
um, or doing different things for our city. So my advice would be just to put yourself out there, try new things and see what happens. You may not like it, that's okay, but at least you know that you're not interested and then you can move on to something else. And once you do find something you're interested in, you could dive a little deeper and get to know exactly what's going on within that environment, within that community and get to really be the person that could advocate for it eventually. That's good. Thank you. Um, and I think I think that's good because, yeah, I think there's this notion that everyone has to have everything figured out and like they have a blueprint and they have a ABC kind of plan. But something that I learned, especially going into corporate America, is that everyone's kind of winging it, <laughs> whether they're uh, up there or down here, like everyone is winging it. And when you look at things and when you look at life with that kind of mindset, the pressure lessens because you're like okay it's okay like I don't need to have everything figured out um and yeah as you said I think just putting yourself out there you never know what you're going to get um a little story about how I met Angela I was supposed to speak at I was representing um the organization that I was working with um for women in tech and I was invited by the dean to attend this round table with alumni and donors and I remember that day I, I really did I did not want to come and Angela later told me that she also didn't really want to come and so it's just interesting because we both showed up we didn't know what we were going to expect but now years later we're here sitting in the same room and um, we've been through so much and to know she's my mentor and my friend is really just I I wouldn't have expected it so David, I wanted to understand from you how, maybe tell me a story about a time where you recognized an unexpected opportunity and how did that, how did that transform your trajectory in a positive way? I'll set the timer again. <laughs> so um, it was in my first year of Drexel. Um, it was in a class called UNIV 101, where basically they teach you about Drexel and how to navigate Drexel and all the systems. And um, there was a, a a young man in my class and they, I mentioned that I was from Ghana. <laughs> and he said, so how did you hear about Drexel? I said, oh, the internet. I was like, oh, you have that? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we got that, we got that. And I, I wasn't offended. I, I just thought it was funny because the thing is, I think when you're, everyone else outside of America is like, knows a lot about America. Like it's it's almost necessary to know much about America. But America doesn't have to know much about the rest of the world, which is I, like it's understandable because if you ask me about certain countries, I might not know much about it. So I understood it and I wasn't offended. I took that as, I guess, an opportunity to and I, it wasn't intentional, but I was like, OK, how can I make someone care about where I'm from? I can't force them to. I can't say, hey, you have to care about this. I can tell them all the good things about Ghana and where I'm from, but they might not necessarily care. So I said, OK, I have to go on a quest. This was this this took me a while to figure out, but I have to go on a quest to sort of the word I use is become undeniable, so that when people ask me where I'm from, like, oh I'm from here, and they're like oh what what like what what does that mean? And then I I'd be able to tell them, so I wouldn't have to go tell them; they would have to come to me to ask me, oh where are you from? Like and then I would be able to share my values with them so that they understand that okay. So in that moment, it wasn't I was I don't, I'm not sure I was supposed to take that from that interaction, but that's what I decided to take from that interaction, and it was very unexpected that. As the years went by and I thought about that experience, I was like, oh, I wonder why, if, I wonder if if I had seen it a different way or done it in a different way, like how, where, where would I have ended up? And today I'm sitting here because that's been my quest. Obviously, blessing, thank you for giving me this opportunity. It's not just I me. Mean, I didn't just get up and show up here. But it's like, I took that opportunity. I could have been offended. I could have just assumed that, oh, this guy is, you know, malicious. But I said, okay, I, I can't make some, if someone decided to make me care about something, I wouldn't care about it. I, I would be very disingenuous about it. But if if someone like uh, Kofi Annan was the, the the UN general secretary, he's gone in. When you hear that name, like, oh, whoa, like what? That's like you're, you're excited. So if someone hears, oh, that David is in this position and he's from Ghana, they're like, oh, interesting. I didn't know that. And even makes people want to go to Ghana to go and invest there. So if they find 10 people on a board of a big company from Ghana, like what's in the water? Like what's the, <laughs> like what are they feeding them? So, so I think it, it's more just understanding human psychology and realizing that people you can't make people care about something you have to do something that sort of leads them to care about that thing so that's kind of 
So, so unexpectedly, that's what I took from that interaction. And I'm sure he doesn't know this. I don't even remember his name, but he was a lovely guy. He was pretty funny. Um, but yeah, hopefully one day I'll see him uh, around. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so as we wrap up this part of the event, I wanted to ask one question, which I think if I could describe what it means to be boundless, it would be this. And it's the idea that you have the ability and the drive to notice opportunities where other people don't. I remember as I was in Drexel, I used to pride myself with this whole, the art of finesse kind of thing, where I realized that the same way that I realized that everyone's kind of winging it, I realized as well that, I don't know, there, there are many things in life that are a bit fickle. And I say that because, for example, I remember I interned at Google and, um, I was creating content just personally. And I remember I got an email saying that, oh, you know, hey, we want to share your video on our social media panels. And I realized that as much as other people will see that, oh, Google posted this about blessing. It's literally just one person that works at Google that posted it and saw it. Um, for example, even being on panels, it's not always that you get reached out to for to be a panelist or to be a keynote speaker. There are many times where I have forced myself to just put my foot down and be like, hey, I see that there's not much representation on your panel. Could I be part of this? And so I learned how to kind of, I wouldn't say I cheated my way into the system, but I just learned how to take advantage of the system. Um, even with scholarships, I mean, one of the reasons why I started the scholarship um, at Drexel for international students was because I saw Angela um, start her own scholarship and I was like okay well you know in my head I thought you had to be a whole philanthropist and you're making millions to provide that kind of support but I realized that well as a student whether it's giving ten dollars or a hundred dollars that's it's still a scholarship in a way and um, but I think sometimes we have this notion that things have to be a certain way and so I really tried and I'm still trying to just break that myth within people's minds. So I wanted to ask you all as we finish this um, panel, how do you go about noticing opportunities? Um, Noma, you're a whole model. <laughs> you're a whole model. So how like how did that come about? Uh, so that specific opportunity happened via Instagram. Somebody, so my agency actually sent me a message, but I thought it was very suspicious for somebody to DM me we're Nigerian, we're very African. I'm very suspicious. My I also like that was not the plan. So I didn't respond, I think, for like two years. Then during the pandemic, um, my uncle modeled when he was like back in the day and he was reminiscing on his like modeling days. So I was like, let me just try. And I was also in grad school. I didn't have a job. So I was like, let me just see what happens. Um, and I applied and I also vetted the agency as well. And I was able to connect with them and then it just worked very quickly. Um, and they gave me the opportunity to work with a lot of brands that I've grown up on and brands that I see all the time and just to get into that business in a way that I feel comfortable and safe at the same time. But with opportunities, um, for me, I do two things. So one is I'm very comfortable. I love community, but I'm also very comfortable going into places on my own. I'm an advocate for solo ventures and solo activities, solo networking opportunities. I don't mind going somewhere and being out of my comfort zone because it it puts me in a place where I have to network and connect with someone. Um, and I feel like I've been doing that since I was in college. I think every, every Friday after I finished classes, I'd go into Center City and I like walk around and then you know, like go to like a restaurant or something. So I got comfortable being by myself. Also traveling, like solo traveling as well, made me very comfortable. So when I go to networking events, I'm very comfortable networking and introducing myself and just staying with strangers and also getting to know people. Um, and then the second thing is actually three things. Two things. The second thing is just shooting your shot. Um, I think the worst, the worst thing someone can they can say worse things than no actually. But no is a <laughs> um, no. It's okay to hear no's, but you will hear yeses for sure the more times you put yourself out there. And the third thing I think is to bloom where I am planted. Um, sometimes I feel like I have to network with people that are above me, but I've recently realized that there's a lot of people at your level who are just as talented, who are just as um, determined, who are just as ambitious. You just have to connect with them. And it's a beautiful thing to grow with people. Just like me and you, like we literally, yeah, we have grown together in such different ways. Um, I think it's 
it's beautiful to grow with the people at your level um, because you can point to each other. And when you rise to the top, you're even the the that are the people that people. But yeah, those those three things for me. Okay, this one. So, for me, I would say uh, it's just being very very curious and asking a ton of questions to people that you meet, either for the first time or met in the past, just to get a sense of like picking the brain, what's happening in their world, what's going on. You may pick up on a little nugget that you may connect to a prior conversation you've had of opportunity that you never would have thought of. Um, there's been plenty of situations where I've been, been given the opportunity to model as well, um, be on different panelists, have different conversations, just because I just put myself out there, um, willing to be uncomfortable in, um, being uncomfortable in comfortable situations where I don't necessarily know anyone, um, but because I'm willing to ask those questions, uh, understand about what they, who this person is, what they do, why they do, and why they love it. Um, I've been given the opportunity to do different things that my peers may not been necessarily been given. So I would say just put yourself out there, be curious, and say yes to as many things as you can. And along the way, you'll figure out if you actually love it or not. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, David. <clears throat> Um, I realize that we're all like everyone has their own path. I realize that everyone has their own path, and if you're looking at someone else's, you won't notice the opportunities on yours. So that's what I had to change my mind to first. It's like everyone has their own puzzle. If I'm looking at someone else's puzzle, I can't solve mine. So you you can be trying to look for opportunities in someone else's lane, where it's like not to say that you don't belong in that lane, but it's not the path that's set out for you. So if you're trying to look for opportunities or or ideas in some, where someone else is meant to thrive, it's very hard for you to actually do the same thing. So first of all, I had to start with a mindset shift. I was like, okay, let me focus on what I want to do. I can't compare myself. I, I was I had roommates. They were working, one, one was working at Tesla, one was working at Microsoft, one was working at uh, Google. I was like, what am I doing? Like I was, I can't tell you what I was doing, but <laughs> so so it was it was just, I had to realize, okay, what can, if I, if I'm too focused on their path, I can't actually notice the opportunities online. And when I finally looked at what I was doing, where, where my strengths were, I was like, just because they're strong in this doesn't mean I'm weak in that same place. So I had to start looking around. And when I started doing that, it started with a curiosity. And that curiosity was in other people to always assume that someone knows something that you don't. Why? Because they definitely know something that you don't. They're coming with completely different experience. I don't know any, I, I don't, I might, I might know blessing, but I don't know blessing. Like there's still a wealth, like if I reading this book, I've, I'm like, what that happened? Like I wasn't, like, I, I didn't know that because people have a wealth of experience, a, a experience. So when you just talk to someone and just be curious, it's not that hard to be curious. Just ask a question. It's like, Oh, how are you? Don't like ask like, how, how are you really like to, to dive into, but just there are things that I've learned, especially with the content I consume is more centered around actually getting to know people, being kind to people. Because like I said, in the beginning, I realized I wasn't self-obsessed, but I realized I didn't care about people as much as I thought. So I was like, how can I actually start to be authentic and talk to people? So in, even in the gym where I'm working out, most of my workout is just talking to people. Like sometimes I'm like, can I go back to my workout? But but it's still like kindness and being humble enough to, to ask questions and not pretend like you care, but genuinely care. People will share stuff with you that you're like, I don't know why you trust me to share this with you. We're in the middle of a gym. I'm in the middle of a workout. But thank you for sharing that. And and sometimes you may not know what to do with it. But when you do that, with the content you consume and the people you talk to, it all kind of comes together. And like, oh, there's an opportunity here. Not to use the person, but to be kind to this person. And and f with making content, I've realized that you can't make people care about what you're making. Because when I was kind, when I stopped focusing on how can I grow, how can I grow, I was like, how can I just help people? I'm trying to help people online that I don't even know. How about I just help someone right next to me? And then I started doing that. And then unbeknownst to me people were talking about my content to other people and then the next thing i know someone who has like a bunch of a big following just posted myself I was like how did it how did this person see my and just exponential growth from there i'm not saying be kind to people because you never know who's gonna like you know be kind to you but i'm saying it it helps it it pays to be kind it, it, it costs a lot to not be kind to people and it's not that hard to be kind to people so with the opportunities it's a combination of being interested in people consuming content that actually leads you or puts you in a place where you can actually take advantage of the desire and because uh, when you notice an opportunity you still have to take advantage of it if you don't know how 
you'll just be stuck there wondering, oh, how do I how do I do this? So you have to look for that in people wherever you can find it. So yeah, that's that's I would say that's that's it. Yeah, people and a bunch of other stuff. I give a round of applause. Um, yeah, I just wanted to use this opportunity to thank um Usman, Noma, and David for their insight and just sharing their stories. Um, there's a reason why I brought you on this panel, and we definitely did what I thought that you would do. <laughs> so thank you so much. One more round of applause. Okay. One. I just want to let everyone know I spoke for like 10 minutes. That's like a record for me. So so thank you all for listening. Um so oh it's okay. So we're moving into the last part of the event, um, which will be some refreshment, networking, um, on the right side on my right side. There's some swag from Rewriting the Code, the organization that I work with. And Kristen is here. She is the vice president of ideas. And um, if you're interested in anything women in tech related, whether it's to partner, whether it's to become a member, you can speak to her there and grab some swag as well. Um, at the back, we have some refreshments, um, some water, some puff puff, which is a Nigerian dessert. Um, it's basically like donut holes. Um, and we have some meat pie and veggie pies as well. And then on the left side of the room, there is going to be me um, with some boundless merch. Um, and if you have a book or if you want to purchase a book, or I think during the raffle as well, um, yes, we can, um, or I can sign some books. But before going into that, I wanted to use this opportunity to honor someone that has really impacted my life. As you've heard, um, both at Drexel and beyond Drexel, I genuinely wouldn't be here without them. Um, and it's quite, it's a bittersweet moment to be here in the same room with her. Um, I remember, I think the first time we met, we met was at the study um, just down the road on Market Street. Um, and then I also remember we had coffee one day um, just opposite the 7-Eleven. Um, and then now we're here years later and um, I'm very grateful for CCI for even bringing us together. Um, but Angela, I just wanted to thank you so much for all that you've done for me. For all that you've done for me and for all that you do for the community as well, so. Um, okay, so yeah, and thank you all for being here. Thank you for supporting me on this journey. Um, thank you, CCI, for even allowing me to to come back to campus to do this. Um, okay, so before we eat some food and talk to people, um, we'll do the raffle. So these are people that win um, a copy of my book. So the first. Ticket number is 350118. You? Yeah, round of applause, guys. Next is 350130. Yeah. <laughs> 350129. No? Oh, oh so, close. <laughs> so close. Anyone? 350129. Okay, we'll do it again. Oh, 350128. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 350125. Yes. And last one. Three five zero one three one. Yes, congratulations. Um, okay, so yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you for um your presence. And actually, I wanted to give maybe five minutes for questions. I completely forgot about that. Um, but if anyone has any questions for myself or for any of the panelists, then we can do that now. Anyone? No? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so speaking as a creative and panelist, uh, thinking about mental health, identity, inclusion, and to me, it's the idea of walking syndrome. So if at any moment, if any of you felt that, 
how did you navigate that? And what, what point did you feel like you finally Ooh. Wow, that's a question. No more. Do you wanna Oh wow, well, you just handed me the mic. Wow. <laughs> um think about it for a moment. Um, I think with imposter syndrome, um, I think I've learned to separate facts from fiction. Um, I think it's important to remind yourself who you are, the talents you have, and what you bring to the table. Um, I think when you are capable of doing so many things, you may feel like you're not at a hundred percent in one specific area, but that's the beauty of being a multifaceted human being. You can do so many things, and that is what makes you unique. Um, I think it's just reminding yourself because it's easy to forget it's easy to uh, have that dissonance that cognitive dissonance when people around you seem to be having it all together or um seem like they're excelling but you have to again the kind of what um, david was saying is like you have to focus on your own puzzle you have to remember the puzzle pieces that make you unique that's that's what i think. i actually wrote something about this so i'm just gonna read it <laughs> it was meant to sound more dramatic so <laughs> uh it's like wherever you go act like you belong whether you go to the gym to work on your strength, to lose weight, or, or to lose weight, act like you belong. Um, I'm not asking you to fake it till you make it. I'm asking you to be the thing you are trying to be. For instance, I have hundreds of writings. Am I a writer yet? Do I have to publish a book and get a bestseller before I can claim the title? No. I am already doing the things that a writer I'm already doing the things that a writer does, therefore I must consider myself one, even if others don't yet. If I think I have to lose weight before I get stronger, before I can enter a gym, I've completely missed the point. If I think I have to be perfect before I can come to God, I've completely missed the point. And this is the line that kind of got me. If I think I must be permitted to be before I am, I have missed the point. It's widely believed that if you claim a title, it means you've mastered it. Far from it, at least not yet. You see, I may have written hundreds of scripts and poems for my videos, but that does not make me a great creator. But with each writing, I get better. With each video, I get better. And this is, this. I really like this line. With every iteration of the actions that constitute being the thing that you want to be, you become better at that thing, but you are still that thing. So with confidence, if you, if and when you enter a room you hope to belong to, act like you belong. And when I, when my mind just shifted like like this, I was like, okay, I want to be. If Blessing wants to be, an, is an author. She was doing the things that an author does, which is write write books. You don't have to be recognized by New York, the New York bestsellers list before you actually realize that. And I, I think when you have imposter syndrome, it's good. It's like an indicator that wait, why do I feel like uh, it's like it should prompt you to be like okay i'm here i'm somewhere that i don't think i belong to meaning that there's a challenge i'm taking on meaning that i'm more capable than i think i am therefore i should be not proud that i have imposter syndrome but like work to combat that by actually proving to myself that oh i actually belong in this place that i'm in like this is my first time ever doing this i don't my voice keeps trembling when i was up there i kept shaking i was like i don't know if i should be here but i did it anyways and now this may be the first of many things that I'll do in the future. So I think despite the feeling of feeling like an imposter, it's like, what do your actions say? If you're even, just the fact that I'm even here should like tell you something. If you're hired to be in a role, it's like, oh no, you belong here. Like if someone thought you deserve to be there, you deserve to be there. But you also have to know yourself that if I'm doing the things, I am I am the thing. So yes, that's, that's true. Hope that answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Ooh. No. I guess, um, you know, from my perspective, I was just thinking of all the people in the industry, and just kind of the way that you hear on the panel, you start going on that, you know, all the accomplishments, uh, but how would you just all define that? Right. Uh, I think for me, the my definition of the success is, am I happy, number one? So I know that 
um, in life that you kind of have this predetermined path of what you want to do while you're growing up, what your parents want you to do while you're growing up. And I kind of had that for me as well. Um, my oldest brother was very upset when I switched my major um, from pre-med to entrepreneurship. His thought process of like entrepreneurship, like how are you going to find a job? You really can't have a career in doing that in particular. So I think it was more of the fear from his point of view that I wouldn't be able to have the life I want to have in the future. But I think it took it upon myself to have confidence in myself, knowing that I made the right decision for me and not for him to continue down the path that I did, knowing that eventually it will work out as long as I keep on going, not stop. I may run through some roadblocks, yes, but then how do I navigate through those and keep moving forward? Some days are better than others, um, but then that's where you kind of have, you can lean on your friends for support. You can lean on people that you connect with closely for support and get through those hurdles, and those roadblocks to keep moving forward. Because then eventually what happened is you start to look back at what you've done and you start to realize like, wow, like you actually accomplished a lot over time and then realize everything you did along that journey to get there. And it was that one decision you've made to keep going that made the biggest difference overall. So I'll say whatever you're going through right now, just keep going. And eventually you look back at it and be happy that you did. Thank you. Does that answer your question? One last question. No. Go ahead. Like so I I can say that I have two mentors who I am in constant communication with and who um, I really admire and look up to. And I think what helped me was first meeting people who are where I want to be. So I talked about how like I was struggling with like applying to med school, my whole med school journey. And I, I literally, I remember it so random. I looked up, should I be a doctor for black people? And I see this girl and she, I think she was in med school at the time. And just, her, the video was like 14 views. I was like, let me just see it. So I watched it and I follow, ended up following her on Instagram and I DM'd her. And um, I connected with her and she ended up bec becoming my mentor. Um, I think she was in, like in her third or fourth year of med school. Now she's a resident, um, an internal medicine resident at Johns Hopkins. Um, and she, similar to me, didn't go straight to med school after she graduated. She took the MCAT, I think maybe four times. Her GPA was so, so, but she got to where she is. She's so confident and bold. And when I talk to her and I see where she is now in her life, I'm so encouraged because one, she's authentically herself and she's always pouring into me to remind me that things will get better and I will get where I want to be. So that connection was just, just shooting my shot and being consistent. Um, one thing I've learned from her though, is I feel like a lot of times with the mentorship, mentor relationship, with the mentor, mentor relationship, it can be a lot of take, take, take on behalf of the mentee, taking advice, taking words of wisdom, like asking questions and getting answers. So it's also important for me as a mentee to also encourage this person. I mean, I might not be able to advise uh, my mentor and her job or anything, but I can encourage her on the path that she is right now and also just pour into her the love and attention that she has given to me. Uh, my other mentor, she's a bit older. She is a, a She's a doctorate. She is an ophthalmologist, I believe. And I connected with her at my co-op at Drexel. She was the only other Black woman at this co-op. Um, and I think my last day, she was like, wait, I'm gonna come here. Like, tell me about your, like, what are you doing? You know, we have to stick together. What are you doing? And so I told her, like, my path. I told her what I wanted to do. And we kept in contact. She ended up paying for me to go to um, a conference, I think the following fall, Abercams for, um, 
for black health professionals because she knew I was interested in medicine. Um, just by making that connection, and she helped me with like recommendation letter of recommendations for med school has been a constant support to me. And she's not someone I keep in contact with like on a monthly basis, but that is someone I can say if I reach out to her and say, "Hey, let's catch up," you know, we'll maybe have like a Zoom call, and she will show me her paintings in her house in North Carolina, and just is very like very welcoming and very friendly. Um, it's just being, it's just nice to be around women who I aspire to be like, and I'm reminded that the dreams I have are valid and they are achievable because these women are doing them and they are doing them authentically. So that's. All right. So I think that's a great place to end and to start the um, networking and eating. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to thank you all for coming. Thank you for your time. Thank you for supporting me as well. Thank you again to the panelists for sharing all that you did. Thank you to I and thank you to the wonderful sister who catered this event. So definitely um, try it. Let us think. Um, and um, yeah, if you ever want to try Nigerian foods, uh, whether that's savory foods or she is a go-to person, so definitely reach out to her and put the flyers out. Well, but thank you so much. <laughs>